Okay, we're going to talk about ADHD today. A lot of you have probably had experience with ADHD, whether directly or indirectly. A few things to point out about language before we get started. You may hear ADD. ADD is an outdated term. It no longer exists in any of the diagnostic criteria that we would use for ADHD. There are different types of ADHD, and one of those is kind of what we used to think of as ADD. So we will talk about that. The main thing we're going to talk about today is how we diagnose ADHD and what we do about it once we have a diagnosis. It is considered a neurological disorder, a chemical imbalance within the brain that is generally treated through medication and or behavioral intervention. All right, let's start by looking at what the criteria are for ADHD within the DSM. So the DSM looks at different types of symptoms for ADHD. The first one is inattention. And this is for children up to the age of 16. They would need six of these symptoms for children and adolescents, or I guess adolescents and older adults over the age of 17, they would need five or more. <clears throat> Some of the things you would look for with inattention are having difficulty keeping attention, obviously, does not seem to listen, does not follow instructions, has difficulty staying organized, very reluctant to do tasks that require kind of heavy effort, loses things, very distracted, forgetful. The second type of symptoms that we look at with ADHD are hyperactivity and impulsivity. And again, we have six or more of these for little ones, five or more once you get over the age of 17. So this is the more obvious kind of motor physical types of symptoms, very fidgety, uh, very, you know, running and climbing, uh, can't take part in activities quietly seeming as if they're kind of driven by a motor, energizer bunny, talking a lot, um, a lot of interrupting, a lot of blurting out, and um, just very impulsive in their decision-making. Now, based on those two types of things, types of symptoms, there are three different categories of ADHD. The first is combined. So you have both the inattentive criteria met and the hyperactive criteria met. The second is inattentive, predominantly inattentive. So these kids are not as hyper, but are very spacey, inattentive, losing things, disorganized, having a hard time kind of not daydreaming. And then the third would be predominantly hyperactive impulsive. So they may not have the inattention problems, but they have problems functioning because of how active and impulsive they are. <laughs> Inattentive ADHD can be very difficult to catch, especially in little ones, because if they are not a behavior problem, they often kind of fall through the cracks. They're kind of, they're sitting quietly at their desk. They're just staring off into space. And those kids don't stand out as much as the ones who are running around the classroom, obviously causing a lot of disruption. So 90% of those diagnosed with ADHD in elementary school are the hyperactive impulsive type. And I think the main reason for that is that they stand out more due to the fact that they're likely very disruptive in their environment. These kids are moving, they're breaking things, they are interrupting people, they, <laughs> excuse me, very in, um, impulsive, have a hard time keeping friends because they can't play, rule, can't play by the rules. They want to go first. They want to go, you know, above and beyond the normal rules of the game. And it's very difficult for them to function in traditional classrooms. They're also more likely to be male as far as the hyperactive impulsive type. There's been a lot of research recently on the effects of cutting down on recess, especially on little boys, and what that does to their brain. And we're seeing an increase in hyperactive and impulsive behavior when kids are not allowed to play, which seems common sense. But as the academic demands on schools get higher, 
there is less emphasis on physical activity. Although I will say the school that my children go to, I have one in kinder and one in first grade, and they both have uh, three recesses a day, three short recesses, which I think is very helpful for them being able to then focus in the classroom. ADHD is very tied to learning problems, as you can imagine. They have a hard time attending, even if their IQ is typical, which it tends to be. The um, typical ADHD profile includes a typical IQ, so an IQ around 100. There will be some deficits within that, which we'll talk about in a second, but their overall functioning tends to be normal. It's just that they cannot attune to instructions, they can't hold still, they're getting in trouble for touching people around them, for talking to people around them, and that causes them to fall behind with curriculum. There's also a high, what we would call comorbidity or overlap with internalizing problems such as depression, anxiety, things like that, because it's hard for them to feel adequate with their daily demands. They're getting nagged a lot at home for not completing tasks because their parents have to complete, you know, have to constantly repeat instructions, you're getting in trouble at school for not sitting still, for um, touching other people a lot, for rocking in their chairs, for staring off into space. <clears throat> and then as I've alluded to, there are some social problems attached to that as well. Some things we look for as far as within the cognitive profile of a child with ADHD are executive functioning deficits. Executive functioning is frontal lobe activity. It is planning, decision making, um, understanding the consequences of your actions. So if you think about a typical brain, um, for women, the frontal, so for all of us, your brain in the womb starts developing what's called the mammalian brain first, the animal brain. Right above your spinal cord is your, the most basic, um, kind of animalistic part of your brain. It's the part of your brain that keeps you breathing, regulates temperature, keeps your heart beating. This is why blows to the back of the head and breaking your neck can often be very um, high risk, critical, even fatal, because if that part of your brain gets damaged, it will no longer communicate with the rest of your body to keep you alive. So that part of your brain develops first through the base of your neck, and then it moves from back, lower back, to upper front. So when a newborn is born, the least developed part of their brain is the frontal lobe, the part right behind their forehead. And that continues to develop through childhood and even into adolescence. For women, the frontal lobe finishes developing around age 23. And for men, it's as late as 27, 28. So, and for, for kids who have ADHD, they are behind. So even though a six-year-old's frontal lobe is already underdeveloped, a six-year-old with ADHD has an even more underdeveloped frontal lobe. So executive functioning is the part of your cognitive process that allows you to make good decisions, stay on task, um, think about the consequences. And so that is a deficit for children who have ADHD. Also, another deficit we would see on an IQ test would be short-term working memory. And this is things like, if you haven't taken intellectual assessment yet, this is things like, I will read you some numbers and you'll read them back to me or you will say them back to me backward. So you're taking in information, you're holding it in your brain, you're manipulating it, and then you're spitting it back out. That is very difficult for children who have ADHD. Self-regulation is basically self-control. We see a lot of issues with staying on task, work completion, um, organization as far as getting your homework home, getting it back to school. If you look at kids' desks who have ADHD, there's often crumpled papers falling out, maybe pieces of food from yesterday, all kinds of things. That's a lack of self-regulation and then impulsivity. I also wanna mention that ADHD, if you wanna conceptualize it this way, falls on a spectrum. We have ADHD on the low end of the spectrum, so the kids that are impulsive, have some social deficits, have a hard time regulating themselves. In the middle of the spectrum would be ODD, oppositional defiant disorder, and then on the far end of the spectrum is conduct disorder. 
Now, a lot of times, children who end up with a conduct disorder diagnosis, which they should not receive as a young child, by the way, we'll talk about that when we get, get to the criteria for conduct disorder. Um, a lot of kids who end up with a conduct disorder diagnosis at 10, 12, had an ODD diagnosis before that, and before that, they had an ADHD diagnosis as a three, four, five-year-old. Now, not everybody who starts out with ADHD ends up um, with conic disorder, certainly, and conic disorder, we will learn later, ends up <laughs> turning into antisocial personality disorder, which is a very small segment of our population. But if you think about it from a spectrum perspective, ADD usually, ADHD usually comes first, then ODD, if that's coming, it will come next, and then conic disorder will come last. And it's kind of a um, more extreme level of these behaviors at each step. However, most children, ADHD is where it ends. And we'll talk about statistics in a second. I wanna talk about what this, how a clinician would look at ADHD. One common use or commonly used diagnostic tool is called the Vanderbilt Assessment Scale. So it's most often used by pediatricians and other maybe general practitioners. So there's a parent information scale. You can kind of look at these symptoms and see how they match up with the DSM criteria we discussed earlier. Does not pay attention, difficulty keeping attention, does not seem to listen, does not follow through, dislikes tasks they don't like, easily distracted, blurts out answers, um, touchy, angry, spiteful, uh, getting into fights, lies. <laughs> so this continues. <laughs> we'll, talk, we'll talk about school, how schools perceive ADHD in a second, but I do want to point out this section right here. Is it affecting their school performance and their home performance? Now, when it's scored, they will separate out those symptoms. So there's a parent scale, a teacher scale, there's also a, a follow-up. So let's say they get medicated. There's a follow-up for parents and a follow-up for teachers so that you can compare the severity of symptoms before and after medication or treatment, behavioral treatment perhaps, therapy. And then at the end <laughs> is the scoring instructions. And you'll see that they do separate out uh, how the symptoms look based on parent and teacher rating and it, whether it falls into the predominantly hyperactive subtype combined, whether we're looking at ADHD, or I mean, sorry, ODD, conduct disorder, and there is a small screener for anxiety and depression. Now, this is a useful tool. It is free. It is not, however, sufficient from a psycho psychological perspective, from a clinician's perspective, to diagnose. It is one piece of the puzzle, it is not the only one. However, a lot of pediatricians will use that. If they spike on that, that will be enough for them to justify medication, which is unfortunate. <laughs> one way that psychologists can diagnose ADHD is by using what's called a CPT, a continuous performance test. These tests are expensive. Um, and what they're looking for, uh, my husband administers these, for example, and I believe it's about 60 to $70 per administration. So I mean, if you're getting paid a thousand dollars for an assessment, it's not a huge deal, but it is a lot more expensive than a rating scale, which costs maybe between two and five dollars per um, administration. But the way that this would work, is that the child will be shown a computer screen. They will be asked to press a button on the computer, like this, this one says space bar, whenever you see a square appear at the top of the screen. And this will just show you what, what the child would see. So when the square appears at the top, you're supposed to hit the space bar. So all of these squares have been at the bottom. There's one, they hit the space bar. They take a break, 
remember to hit the space bar when the square is at the top. So bottom, top, top. And you can kind of see how that would work. What this is looking for is impulsive behavior. If the kid is constantly hitting the space bar when the square is at the bottom, or they are not hitting it fast enough when it's at the top, that will show as a deficit of kind of that self-regulation, um, self-control aspect of ADHD. The Connors three is a very common rating scale that can be given to parents and teachers. It can also be given to the child themselves once they reach a certain age, I believe it's around eight. This is a table that I actually had in one of my reports. These are the scales that the Connors will give you. So it gives you inattention, hyperactivity, impulsivity, learning problems, executive functioning, defiance and aggression, peer relational issues. And then from those, it ties them into actual DSM criteria for ADHD inattentive, ADHD hyperactive, conduct disorder, ODD. And then the global index is the likelihood of an ADHD diagnosis. And they'll tell you, you know, if they met criteria for both ADHD inattentive and ADHD hyperactive, that it's they meet criteria for combined. Okay, so once a child has been diagnosed, and just to kind of recap from a psychological perspective, the way that I would go about diagnosing ADHD would be a cognitive test, an IQ test, to look for deficits in executive functioning, working memory, uh, short term working memory. Um, I would look at teacher rating scales, parent rating scales, self-report if the child is high functioning enough. Ideally, I would look at a CPT, continuous performance test, to get an object, you know, completely objective, non-biased look at how impulsive they are. And I would also want a broad behavior scale, such as the BASC or the CBCL, to rule out other causes of inattention, like um, depression, anxiety, or recent trauma. So once we have our diagnosis, let's assume our diagnosis is correct and they have ADHD, there are a few treatment options behaviorally. <laughs> One is differential reinforcement. The idea behind differential reinforcement is that you reinforce a behavior that is alternative to the undesirable one. So this child is very hyper. Let's say they're constantly out of their seat. Then we want to reinforce staying in their seat, right? Being on task. Whenever we talk about behavioral treatment this semester, and I will remind you over and over, the first thing you have to do is objectively define what the problem is. So yes, this child has ADHD. I am not concerned as an interventionist, as a behavioral clinician, in trying to alter their brain chemistry. We'll talk about medication in a second, but let's say there is a neurological cause. Let's say this is a drug baby who has really impulsive, hyperactive behavior. I can't, ha I don't have a time machine to go back and make mom not do drugs while, <laughs> while she's pregnant. However, I can reinforce this child for staying in his seat, right? Which will allow him then to access curriculum. It will allow him to have more positive interaction with the teacher because he's not running around. So the more that a client engages in that alternative behavior, such as staying in their seat, the more likely they are to experience reinforcement for it, like getting good grades, getting positive attention, getting social praise, getting the kids around them to like them more. No one likes, at least not for a long time, you know, an extended amount of time. Kids, kids get annoyed with really impulsive kids who are loud, who don't let them get a word in edgewise, who don't let them ever, you know, make up the rules to a game, who are destructive. And so it allows them to get more kind of the natural consequences of being a good friend, a good team player. <clears throat> um, the most effective thing within differential reinforcement is to reinforce what's called an incompatible behavior. You cannot do these two things at the same time. So you cannot sit on your hands and hit someone 
at the same time. So it's a competing behavior and we want to reinforce <laughs> sitting on your hands in this example, as opposed to smacking someone. Um, and kids with ADHD do tend to be very handsy. They don't have to be aggressive, but they tend to be very touchy. They tend to be close talkers. They tend to be loud talkers. And so if we can reinforce an incompatible behavior, such as not touching, not speaking loudly, um, then we can allow them to have some opportunities for social reinforcement that will give them, you know, kind of a taste of what the other half lives like. Life doesn't have to be this way. <laughs> Non-contingent reinforcement is, let's say that the child is, maybe they have a diagnosis, maybe they don't, but they're acting out to get attention. So non-contingent reinforcement is you're gonna get attention, positive attention, regardless. And it's the idea of being satiated or full. If you get tons of positive attention, you don't have to act out for positive attention. Or excuse me, you don't have to act out for attention. And so what's maintaining the behavior is getting a laugh from my friends or getting attention from my friends, then you try to give them that without having to act out. And that allows them then to see that you can get attention without acting out. Many kids, the most, the quickest way to get attention is to act out. Because if you have a kid who's sitting quietly or a kid who's running around with scissors in their hand, you're gonna address the scissors first. And maybe it's negative, but being negative is better than nothing. Um, research has shown that children who grow up in homes of neglect actually have worse outcomes than kids who are exposed to physical and even sexual abuse because a kid would rather be hit than ignored. And that is very sad, um, but any attention is better than none. And so if we can kind of lavish attention on these kids, a lot of times that will correct some of the behavior. When we're talking about punishment, um, there's two different types of punishment. I'm not going to get really into this right now. We will touch on this quite often throughout the semester. You'll see it written as negative versus positive attention or negative versus positive punishment. That does not mean good versus bad. All punishment should be aversive to the child and it should lead to a decrease in that behavior occurring again. However, negative means you're removing something. Positive means you're adding something. So um, negative punishment is things like grounding. You are removing something they want. Social interaction, you're removing their phone, you're removing their door, you're removing their ability to go out on the weekends. So you're removing something they want. Positive punishment is you're adding something like a spanking, like extra chores, like um, extra responsibilities, and you're trying to get them to decrease the problematic behavior through adding things they don't like. Extinction is when you remove the previously um, gotten attention for that behavior. Most common example of this is sleep training. So um, sometimes kids, toddlers will still be waking up multiple times a night. At that point, it is not necessary for them to wake up. When you have a newborn, it is necessary for them to wake up every couple hours to eat. A newborn stomach is the size of a ping pong ball. And so it doesn't take much to fill up and it doesn't take much for them to be hungry again. So it's developmentally appropriate for them to wake up every two hours. Once a child is nine months old, their stomach can hold enough to keep them full throughout the night. They do not need food in the middle of the night. However, they may be getting other needs met by crying in the middle of the night, such as attention, comfort, being held. Um, and so if you stop giving them attention for crying at night, eventually they will stop crying and they will sleep through the night. And that's called sleep training. It's <laughs> very difficult. Many parents cannot do it or are not willing to do it. And then you have three and four year olds who are still waking multiple times a night, crawling into bed with you or never leaving your bed to begin with. So extinction is removing attention for a behavior you no longer want to see. 
so you're not really punishing, you're just removing a response. This is great, it's very effective. However, there is often an extinction burst, which means the kid's gonna test the limit. You know, instead of crying 10 minutes before they go back to sleep, they'll cry for 30. And that's called the extinction burst. Once you get past that extinction burst, the behavior generally ends. Sometimes it does get worse before it gets better and it's always good to remind parents that is a reality. <laughs> Time out is a type of negative punishment. You withdraw access to reinforcement immediately after. There's a lot of different views on timeout. We're gonna talk about it quite a bit this semester. Um, it needs to be brief. The kid needs to be aware of why they're getting punished and for how long. It should be terminated only when the time has passed and the parent says so. So one problem that parents run into is they set like a kitchen timer. The timer goes off regardless of what the kid has been doing during those three minutes. They are out of timeout. Really, it needs to be the parent is in charge. And it should not be used um, when the kid wants out. So let's say the kid, this happens a lot in the schools, the kid doesn't want to do his math worksheet. He throws his math worksheet on the floor. The teacher puts him in the corner. By the time he gets out of the corner, math is over. Well, he just got what he wanted. He wanted to escape an undesirable activity, and he got to. Or he gets to go next door to another teacher's classroom, and it's fun in there. Or he gets to walk for a very long time, you know, takes his time <laughs> walking down the hall to the office. While he's in the office, he gets talked to for a while, comes back to the classroom, and now math is over. And uh, sometimes we don't think through why a kid is doing what he's doing. Another example of, of a kind of correction within treatment for kids who are very impulsive is response cost. That is losing something you want. As adults, we get parking fines, things like um, obviously parking fines, speeding tickets, um, having to pay extra interest on you know, your credit card if you don't pay your bill completely, um, having to pay penalties to the IRS. These are losing valued items. But for kids, it might be losing uh, TV time, tablet time, dessert, recess time. Uh, as they get older, maybe they lose points if they turn in things late, which may or may not sink into them. But the other way we deal with it. And then lastly is Overcorrection. I'm not sure why this slide didn't change. The idea behind overcorrection is you lose something. So let's say you um, slam the door. You slam the door, then you're going to go open and close the door quietly 10 times to show that you can. Um, you throw your food or throw your plate in the sink aggressively because you're upset. You're gonna take that plate out, walk to the table, walk back to the sink, put it in gently, take it back out, walk back to the table, walk back to the sink, put it in gently. You're gonna do that five times until you show that you can do it correctly. So that's overcorrection. If you played sports growing up, maybe you had to, you had to run. Um, you know, everybody didn't run their suicide quickly enough, so they run it twice. That's overcorrection. And it can be very effective for kids with ADHD because it keeps them moving, but it also teaches them how to act appropriately. <laughs> I also want to show you some examples of self-monitoring interventions. This website is called Intervention Central. We will utilize it quite a bit this semester. But this website shows um, some behavioral intervention as, as well as academic. And we'll talk about academic when we talk about learning disabilities um, in the next lecture. But ADHD often comes with uh, self-monitoring issues, as I mentioned. So here's the target behaviors you want to monitor. Staying on task, making positive statements, completing your work complying with teacher requests, uh, getting through the reading, you know, during study time, completing math worksheets, whatever it is. And then you're gonna have the, ch the child, depending on their functioning level, have a rating scale, a checklist, a frequency count, 
that they are keeping track of. And basically this can be as simple as a post-it on their desk where they check off items as they finish them. <coughs> it can be something like every 10 minutes, they have a little timer that vibrates and they check whether or not they're on task. It can be the teacher walking by and just patting them on the back at regular intervals and they check whether or not they're doing what they're supposed to do. And it helps kind of move the accountability from the adult to the child. And then they get some rewards as a result of staying on task for a set amount of time. Let's talk a little bit about medication. So it's easy to make kind of glossy, um, you know, heavy statements about whether or not we should be medicating children. ADHD medication is the most common medication given to kids. It starts usually as young as three and uh, often continues through adolescence. And for many kids, and maybe you know some of these kids, it is a game changer. Within days of starting medication, they are able to attend, they're less impulsive, they're less aggressive. If you think about the brain, of a child with ADHD having chemical imbalances, this is the quickest way to correct those imbalances. The best long-term outcome for kids is if they are in a combination of low-dose ADHD medication and behavioral intervention, with the emphasis being on behavioral intervention taking over medication eventually. So you start out with medication and therapy together, you slowly fade out medication and you slowly increase the accountability that is put on the child to implement the skills they learned in therapy. ADHD is not necessarily something that gets outgrown. However, the amount of medication given statistically goes down as the child gets older, ideally because they have started to feel what normal feels like and they know how to attend to get to that point again. Um, in high school and college, I, I dated a young man with ADHD, um, hyperactive type, and he <laughs> may have been combined type. He was on medication when we were together, um, at least initially, and he would go off of it in the summers. It's very common. And it was, he was a very different person. We often had a lot more issues in the summer because he was more impulsive and making bad decisions. He was very intelligent, and he ended up going to Georgetown for law school and is now kind of a big shot attorney in Denver. And when we last touched base, he was completely off of his medication, but he said the only way that he could be off his medication is if he ran at least a mile every morning. So he had to get that kind of adrenaline rush, get a lot of that energy out, and then he was able to meet the demands of a very demanding job. And so that's a pretty common course as far as adults tend to find a way to cope um, that they couldn't as a child once they have seen and felt what it's like to not be constantly distracted and to not feel that constant urge to move. So um, some of the things you'll hear from parents is that Kids who start out using medication are more likely to become drug addicts. <clears throat> there is actually, as you can see here, some meth, <laughs> some of the same ingredients that are in meth are in um, stimulant medication. Speed, for example, as we know it, is a stimulant. Um, stimulant medication is highly abused on college campuses. It is something that you cannot medicate yourself appropriately through you know, well-monitored psychiatric doses of medication. Maybe you do self-medicate with things like meth. And that is, that is a thing. That is a common thing. Does it cause drug addiction? No. But sometimes we, you know, we do see kids, adolescents and adults self-medicating with other, you know, controlled substances. And I think that there is some concern about, you know, about medicating toddlers. 
you think about the, the brain thing I talked about at the beginning, that part of their brain is not done yet. It's not even close to done and we are messing with it. So as a parent, I understand wanting to try other things first. And um, I would always advocate for parents to try the therapy techniques first, maybe fade in a light dose of medication and then fade it back out, but always under doctor's supervision. And uh, to the point that, that it's needed so that the child can experience positive interactions with the adults and the kids in their life. You don't want to constantly, as a parent, be nagging a child for things that are hard for them to control, and you don't want their interaction with the school system to be unpleasant. I do want to point out one last thing before we finish up this presentation, and that is that a school system does not have its own diagnosis, its own special education diagnosis for ADHD. They fall into the category of other health impairment. And other health impairment needs to be diagnosed by a medical or a by a medical clinician or a psychologist. So a school psychologist, for example, can not, their diagnosis of ADHD is not enough. You would need to back that up with a medical diagnosis. Often what I see is that the school psychologist will diagnose ADHD um, type symptoms by giving the cognitive profile, the Connors, the BASC, then that parent will take that report to the pediatrician. The pediatrician will sign off that it's ADHD, and then the school will put them into special education based on other health impairment. It's ironic because the diagnostic process that a school psychologist will go through to diagnose a child with ADHD is much more rigorous than the checklist they will likely get from a pediatrician. However, that is the way that special education law is written. There is not a separate educational or special educational category for ADHD. It falls into the same diagnostic category as asthma, as chronic pain, as um, any other diabetes, any other type of medical diagnosis that will cause difficulty with attention. So a kid with diabetes, for example, may have trouble attending when their blood sugar is low, right? And so the school accommodates that the same way that they accommodate the neurological diagnosis of ADHD. I hope it's been helpful. The next lecture to look at before um, our next class is the one you will see on learning disabilities. And I will send you that link.